afternoon and uh, welcome to today's briefing. Uh, we've had a lot of interview requests to talk to uh, Entry Flight Director Leroy Kane about his activities uh, on February 1st uh, during Columbia's entry. Um, so we thought this briefing would be a good idea as a way to handle those interview requests and still allow Leroy time to work on the investigation and the uh, accident uh, investigation that's taking place. So without uh, any other remarks, uh, Entry Flight Director Leroy Kane. Thank you, James. Um, as most of you know, and, and as you have seen in the, if you've seen the video, um, and I know most of you probably have by now, um, this was uh, this was a tragic day for all of us um, on the flight control team. It was, as you know, if you've been around here for the last 10 or 12, 13 days, it was a very sad day um, for the entire NASA and contractor family. Um, part of the message that I, I want to give you today, and, and the main message I want to give you, is that um, I was very proud of the way the team performed on Saturday in the face of the, the tragic events. Um, I remain proud of them uh, in these days, in the aftermath, and the work that they're doing, and the commitment that they show. Um, they're a very professional group of individuals. Um, they remained very dignified and they showed a lot of integrity in the face of uh, adversity. And I'm very proud of them for that. Um, our hearts and our thoughts and prayers go out to the crew and to their families, and, uh, and that will continue to, uh, to be with us for for a very long time. Um, I would tell you that, and I think most of you know who have been around here, that this team and the NASA team has great resolve. Um, we will get through this, and, and we will do it with the help of each other and with the help of the community, with our families, and with the rest of the uh, agency, and, and I think the, the, uh, the public has shown us uh, just a tremendous amount of support everywhere we look and in everything we've done since Saturday. Um, what have we been doing since then? Our team, uh, like many of the teams across the program, have been involved. We've been very integral and, and involved in the, in the recovery and investigation efforts, and we will continue to be involved um, for as long as it takes. Um, we very much look forward to better days in the future um, where we will fly again and, and move forward. Um, I think that's the extent of the remarks I wanted to make at the opening, and we can take questions. Okay, so we'll start with some questions here in Houston and uh, then go around to other NASA centers. Okay, and please state your name and affiliation prior to your question. Dan Molina from NBC News. Mr. Kane, uh, realizing how difficult it must be for you to relive those moments, could you please uh, take us through your thoughts? When did you realize that you were dealing with something extremely serious uh, and to the point where you realized you had a catastrophe on your hands. Okay, Dan, the, um, from the very first indications that we had uh, of the hydraulic return temperature indications being failed, I, that, that gave me pause. Um, there were several of the smaller events leading up to the loss of signal where I became increasingly concerned um, given that most of the activity in the, in the sensors that were failed and things of the like was on the left wing. So there was some increasing concern. Um, we uh, remained focused and we did the things that we were trained to do. Um, there was a point after which we should have handed S-band communications down to the ground site, which would have taken away any kind of TDRS network problem out of the equation. Um, and uh, that was significant to me. Um, also significant to me was that uh, we weren't able to gain, uh, regain communications with the crew on UHF um, radio. That was significant. 
uh, as we continued on, the fact that we didn't get tracking data when we were supposed to was, was another significant event. And these things, as they accumulated, it became clear to me that, um, that we had some kind of significant problem, and the extent of which we still didn't know. And, and my primary focus was to try and regain communications. And when we did, what would we need to do, go do first? Um, there came a point in time where we um, received some information in the control room that was not verified. It was not on the recorded loops. It was what we, it was over the airwaves, um, and it had to do with some individual citing multiple pieces uh, in a flyover. Um, that was a significant um, point for me also because although it was unverified, it was um, not the kind of information I was looking for given the, uh, the events that led up to that. So um, there was a point uh, after that where I had to call the uh, convoy commander and explain that our our loss of communications had been extended and was now on the order of 10 minutes, and we didn't have any tracking still, and uh, essentially communicating to him that, that we didn't know where Columbia was. Okay. Jim, hey, uh, Jim Oberg with NBC News. Mr. Kane, you mentioned that you did what you're trained to do. Can you comment on the kind of training your team had gone through, including the anomalies, and were there any kinds of anomalies thrown at you in training that reminded you partly of what you were seeing this time? Well, as, as you know, Jim, um, a lot of the scenarios that we train to are uh, considered to be not credible, multiple failure kind of scenarios, and we do that on purpose. We do that to stress the team so that if we ever get into a situation um, that, that uh, is, is steeped in adversity like this one was, um, that we will be able to automatically rely on our training. And so in a general sense, to answer your question, um, the multiple scenario um, high impact, if you will, training that we do on a regular basis um, prepared us for this day to be able to, to step through the kinds of things uh, that we know how to do because, after all, while we know now that many of the things that we did and talked about and actions that we took were futile. We didn't know that then, and on a different day they might not be. Uh, Juan Lozano, the Associated Press. Uh, this is related to the, uh, the statement the board released yesterday about the possible breach in the wheel well and whether that might have let in plasma in there. I want to see if I can get your thoughts on that, your take as far as if you what you think of that, if that's a possibility, and if, if that isn't a possibility, I guess are there other things that could have explained the various uh, temp the, temp the uh, temperature sensor anomaly readings you had gotten on the left side of the wing, if it was in plasma, if there was something else that might have caused those various uh, uh, sensor readings? Okay. Um, certainly the... Uh the possibility of hot gas in the in the wing is is something that is on our fault tree. Um, we're going to basically go wherever the data leads us, and what I mean by that is we will now that we have put together a fairly extensive um, fault tree, the next part of the process that, that we will endeavor to get into will be to um, begin to systematically eliminate legs on that fault tree. As of yet, we haven't eliminated any legs on that fault tree. And so is it a possibility? I would have to say yes, it's a possibility, along with the, the whole range of things that are possibilities, um, because we haven't begun to, to check things off on those legs. But that is the, uh, the management tool that we will use to step through this in a systematic way. But there are many, many other possibilities. Let's go down this side and go back here. And then we'll go this side of the Mary Stasio, News 24, Houston. Um, if indeed there was a hole in the orbiter and it was noticed during the mission itself, could a change in the reentry angle of the orbiter have saved, um, have saved the shuttle? Uh, 
We do not think so. Um, because the trajectory that we designed and the trajectory that we flew um, is one that by definition um, from, a, from a thermal heat load, heat rate standpoint uh, is optimized. So we do not think that for a given knowledge of a given hole or, or breach or something of that nature, um, everything that, that, that we know today says that we would, we're doing the best we can with the trajectory that we flew. So, question? Hi, Eric Holm from Newsday. There was one point on the tape where it appeared that uh, it, your shoulders sagged and one of the women behind you, I, I think it was Ellen Ochoa, uh, was also there. I think, was it Phil Engeloff who told you something? Uh, you, you were speaking to him and then you turned around and that was when you said lock the doors. Remember what, what happened at that moment? I do. In fact, that was the, um, that was the point in time where we had received some unconfirmed information relative to some sightings. And when I put that information with uh, the known events that we already had, uh, it gave me great pause. Okay, Mark. Uh, Mark Caro from the Houston Chronicle. I, I'd like to follow on that question and your response. What was going through your mind at that time as sort of the, the leader of the operational room? What, what were you hoping and expecting from the other flight controllers and the other people supporting you? And how difficult was it to sort of hold everyone together? What was, I guess I just was looking at your, your sort of frame of mind that you'd received this information. The rest of the team probably didn't have what you had, but was wondering the same thing you might have been wondering just intuitively. And how were you, what were you trying to do to hold everyone together to do each step that you need, knew needed to be done at that point? Well, I think the best way I can answer your question is to say that um, we still didn't, didn't know what we had. And we relied on our training and, and it was automatic really and truly it was an automatic thing um, that that triggered us into action and kept us moving forward on a path that we did know and understand we did know and understand the things that we should expect where the vehicle should be when it should be there when should we get tracking when should we get UHF um, at what point can we begin to put the trackers and the S-band systems in a search mode? We stuck with the things that we knew and understood. We didn't allow ourselves to get, to get head down and tunnel into something that was, um, was of concern, unverified, and, and would have potentially led us astray had the circumstances been different where it could have made a difference. So the, 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 the instinct that we had to, to keep moving forward and to keep communicating and to keep stay in our checklist um, was, was one that, that we rely on and that I think um, this situation showed that was very valuable. Scott Gold of the Los Angeles Times. Can you give us a little bit more background about yourself, how long you've been with NASA, how many flights you have uh, controlled in the past, and also looking forward, what your next, uh, obviously after the investigation, but what your next uh, assignment would be as far as flights go? Well, I've been here um, in this business since I graduated from college in 1988, and um, I've been a working for NASA since 1991. I was selected uh, to be a flight director in 1998. I have somewhere on the order of a dozen missions as a flight director between ascent and entry and on orbit phases. Um, as far as the schedule in front of us, of course, there's, there's uh, some things that we'll relook at depending on how things lay out. But the schedule as it was, um, when we launched STS-107, um, I uh, was and am scheduled to work 
the next mission, STS 114, and as well as 116 and 117 in this same capacity. Um, and then uh, I am the lead flight director on STS 118. And there, there's some manning subsequent to that, but it's probably not germane given the schedule changes that we'll be looking at. Kelly Young at Florida today. Um, got a technical question for you here. And I'm not a pilot, so I'm sorry if I'm off base here, but um, it says in the timeline that one of the last elements was the, the, the left elevon um, going up about eight degrees. D does that make sense if, if the orbiter's rolling or yawing left because of increased drag? It does. In fact, uh, part of what we're doing, what you're seeing, is trying to, after this initial, uh, initial surge of data collection and assimilation, is we're trying to um, find correlation between the different subsystems. Um, if you begin to see something happening on the wing in one subsystem, then you want to look at the other subsystems like flight control. And uh, in fact, the uh, elevon and aileron and flight control activity um, is consistent with, with the other parameters that we were seeing in the other subsystems up, up until now. Question. Hi, Mr. Kane. Uh, it's Aaron Katursky from KTRH Radio. We see you on the video rub your forehead and your eyes, and, and we see a lot of the motion, but we can't hear it, what's not on the, on the flight loop. And I was wondering if maybe you can give us a sense of what was in the back of your head while you were trying to stay focused and keep the game face on uh, without revealing anything that you don't want to reveal. But and, and how hard it was to come to the conclusion to lock the doors and to, to sort of reach the, the steps in the process you needed to reach? Um, actually, what I, what I was doing right at that moment in time is I was saying a prayer. And, um, and then uh, after I did that, um, I knew it was time to go and take the next step. And uh, my prayer was for the crew and for their families. And because uh, you have to remember, even at that point, um, we didn't know the details of the breakup. We didn't know the details of the of the uh, of the situation as it, as it was. Um, all we knew was was that we had a significant event that that was probably catastrophic. But in my mind. I still didn't know perhaps the part of the of the crew module could have remained intact for some period of time and so I began to think about things like ground forces and getting people mobilized and and looking for shoots and things of that nature so my answer to your question is that um, we we went the next step and it was difficult to accept but it wasn't difficult to execute, again, I would say, because of our training. Gina Treadgold, ABC News. How and when did you officially find out what happened that morning? Um, we found out from the folks um, in, the, in the area we had verifiable information from folks in the area um, that could verify the vehicle breakup. And in addition to that, we had video um, that one of the local stations in Dallas had picked up. I believe it was WFAA and CNN had picked that up. So we had two or three verifiable um, sources that, that the vehicle had essentially uh, come apart. and. Uh, and that's when we set in motion the contingency plans. Okay, did we have uh, any other people who haven't asked a question here? I think it, since everybody here has had one question each, let's go to Kennedy now and then, Nancy oh, Holland. Nancy? Yeah, let me go, Nancy. Sorry, I missed you. Nancy Holland, KHOU. I, there was a shot in the tape that I saw this morning, and I think it was uh, Ellen Cho, and it looked like a red folder and I don't know if that has any significance or not is is there a significance to the red folder is that part of the contingency plan or was that just no um, what I what I think you saw Nancy was um, the the flight control operations handbook is a big thick 
book and most of the ones that we have um, are in these red binders and if I'm not mistaken I believe the FCOH the flight control ops handbook is in one of those red binders if you saw something other than that I don't know what it would be okay now let's go to Kennedy and, and take questions there uh, this is Phil Chen, Earth Noise, Leroy. Uh, looking at the transcripts, looking at uh, all of the timelines, it seems obvious uh, that you guys did everything you could, and uh, unfortunately it was, it was uh, fated to be a da bad day. Having said that, I'm wondering at uh, 1352.17 GMT, uh, there was a left main gear uh, temperature which uh, was rising al almost two minutes before the um, Elevon problems that Max reported to you, and I was just curious why that wasn't reported to you. And on, I suppose on a little bit happier note, uh, obviously you worked a lot with um, Rick Husband um, since he was the commander. Can you tell us any anecdotes about him, any uh, things that you guys shared? Okay. Um, Phil, with respect to the, the temperatures, what, what you're seeing and, and what some of you, if you haven't seen, you probably will. Um, as we went back and pulled all of the telemeter data, everything that's on in the telemetry stream that we had captured. There are some parameters that we, in fact, don't monitor in real time. There are some parameters that, although we monitor them in real time, um, we did not see a trend, and you would not see a trend until some number of minutes, some single digit probably number of minutes, a few at least. So when we've gone back now, to reconstruct that timeline. For example, the first indications of a change um, in the rate uh, of a temperature rise, well, the only reason we know that's significant now is because we marched ahead in time and we've shown that it was a rate and that it was a rate that was sustained. In real time, it's very difficult to do that unless you have something that's very steep and sustained which we didn't have. That's not really characteristic of the kinds of temperature increases that we're talking about. So it, the answer is two part. One is we don't look at all of those um, sensors in a real time um, fashion. And the other one is that for some of them that we do look at, um, it takes some time to see a rate and to recognize that that might be significant. So that's why we didn't see in real time all of the things that you see on this timeline that's being constructed. Um, as to your question on Rick, um, the thing that I would share with you is, is that he was, um, there, there probably wasn't a, a more perfect fit in the, in the crew office for putting together um, and leading this particular crew. Um, this was a marvelous group of individuals, um, very high powered um, in terms of their capabilities. Um, they were also very diverse and came from a very diverse backgrounds. And Rick with his um, kind of laid back, very easygoing um, style I think that lent itself very well to them being able to meld as a crew, which they did. This crew had a little bit more time in training, as you recall, because of some of the delays. And they really and truly, by the time they went and flew, they, they were a family in and of themselves. And it was, it was just pure joy being around them and working with them. This is Chris Kreidler from Florida today. Uh, you were kind enough to answer some questions the other day. Um, and some of those included what you knew before this day began. I'm just wondering if the mood going into this landing day was any different from any other. Did you feel like there was anything unusual you needed to look out for on this day? No, I, I didn't feel that way. And, and my mood was, um, it was, uh, it was very normal, and it, it was as it has been in other deorbit and entries that I've worked. Um, it was I was trying to explain this the other day, and, and I was using words like the normalcy of it was um, the way I was describing it. And um, we, when we came in in the morning, it, it was as things should be on entry day, and, and um, we weren't working any significant problems. We were able to get in the checklist. The crew was ahead of the timeline in the checklist. Everything was setting up to be just as I would want it to be. Um, 
with respect to being able to deorbit and, and land that day. Um, we worked a few issues with the weather, and that's, as you know, um, very typical. So I would describe it as being a very normal, right down the middle. I had no, no, no concerns whatsoever coming into this day. This is Seth Borenstein from Knight Raider Newspapers. Uh, forgive me for going back to more investigatory questions. But in terms of uh, yesterday's uh, analysis, the analysis that uh, both you and the uh, Accident Investigation Board uh, talked about yesterday, it talks about if the heat transfer couldn't be from a, tile, a missing tile or a lost tile issue. What about uh, in terms of the breach you see, could that be from uh, multiple tiles? Is there sort of a bound of how, how many uh, X number of tiles could give you such of a breach um, where that might be in terms of a low threshold? Well, um, Seth, I don't, I don't believe that we've zeroed in on, on by any means on the fact that we have that we suffered a breach. Um, I think there's many legs of the fault tree that that we still need to consider, um, and that I, that's how I would answer your question. Is um, I, don't, I don't think that we're settled on that at all. Bill Hart with CBS, uh, Leroy. Um, Ron Didemore said during, and this is just a follow up on something you said earlier today. Ron Didemore said last week that that maybe um, if you knew that there was a really serious problem, if you had telemetry or photographic evidence or whatever, that you could get the crew to a bailout. I just wanted to know if you said that there's no way to shape a trajectory to, to minimize heating because you're already at the minimum, and I understand that. If you don't get to a runway, and I understand you can't get to a runway, but if you could you, do, could you design a reentry profile that doesn't go to a runway that just is designed to get the thing to a bailout altitude? Is that even theoretically possible? Well, it's theoretically possible. Um, the thing that that doesn't do for you necessarily is it doesn't change your heat load um, the way that that you would be desiring to do if you were postulating some kind of situation where you had some some place on the orbiter that you were trying to minimize the impact for. So there are lots of different things you can do, Bill, but when we look at those things, they, they don't necessarily solve the problem for us and they just lead to potentially other problems. Uh, Mr. Kane, this is Stefan Kledan with the New York Times asking uh, this question that I really hate asking, but at one point I saw in the video today that you had tears rolling down your cheeks. Uh, at what point did that happen? Um, that, that happened right after I I uh, took a moment to myself, and I had pretty much realized that the vehicle came apart and that we needed to to, uh, to take actions consistent with okay. with that. Um, I, if I remember right, that's when that happened. Uh, this is Phil Chen with Earth News again, Leroy. Um, I said in the previous, my previous question that uh, it's at least very evident to me that there's absolutely nothing your flight control team could have done that day. Uh, when did that become evident to you, or is there still any lingering doubt uh, that uh, if you'd done anything any differently that the outcome could have been different? And was there a relief or a sigh that, uh, thank heavens, it's not my team that uh, messed up uh, when uh, that realization came, or lead me through that? Um. I never had any doubts, um, and I still don't doubt what we did or didn't do. Um, you're correct in that the kind of problem that we suffered on this day, there isn't anything in my estimation um, that the flight control team could have done differently or should have done differently. Um, and with respect to your question about what was I relieved, um, no, I, I was not relieved because I don't, I don't, I personally don't think it's about one team or the other team. I think it's about us, and I think it's about us looking at what happened here and trying to find out um, as an agency and as a program 
and all the way down to the various groups and and uh, and elements. We're, we're all in this together, and so no, I, I wasn't at all relieved. Uh, Dan Billow at West TV. Uh, it's good of you to answer these difficult questions. Uh, you may have touched on this. Could you clarify that? At what point uh, during the entry did you did you think about the debris hit on the left wing and think that maybe something was going on with that? And did you ever think before, say, before 8 a.m. Uh, that that you had a possibility of losing the vehicle? The first time I thought about that was the very first call from the mechanical systems officer from Max when Jeff Kling called and and said, uh, Flight Max have lost four hydraulic return line temperature indications. And because he, with his call, indicated that it was on the left wing and the left elevons, that that gave me pause. That was the first time I thought about that debris took that we hit on ascent. Um, and then several hundred microseconds after that, we began to talk about what does that mean to us, and, and we moved on. Um, and I forget what the second part of your question was. Sorry. I was wondering if before 8 a.m., before, before the vehicle was lost and contact was lost, did, did you think in your mind at any time that you might lose it? Um, I would have to say no. I, I did not think that that we would lose it. Uh, Leroy, it's Bill Harwood again with a question and a half. I apologize, James. The, in the timeline you guys put out, the first Elevon trim adjustments are listed out over California. I couldn't tell if that was an anomalous reading or if that was a normal reading. I'm assuming anomalous simply since it was in there, but um, just idle curiosity on that one. And the, and the other part of the question, which is totally unrelated, so I guess it really is two questions, James, and I apologize again. Um, you told us the day before entry, obviously, that, that uh, we talked about the debris hit on the wing, and, and you mentioned that uh, the analysis had been done and everybody was confident there was no issue. I, w I was curious if during the flight as an entry flight director, is that something that you simply hear the results of that, or did, w did you hear the pitch about why it wasn't considered an issue, or is that just something the, the MMT reports to you and you, you basically take their word for it, but you never actually saw any data on that? Um, let me answer that question first. Um, the answer is that I, I was um, involved. I did have an understanding of, of, of the analysis. I did have an understanding of, of the disposition um, within the process that we have. And so, um, yes, I, I, I was, uh, was involved to that extent. Um, on the Elevon trim, I'm not sure exactly which point you're talking about, but um, as you know, at, at, at Q bar value of two, which is very early relative to the entry, the elevons become active and they go through a little profile. Um, and that may be what you're showing. We do have some things on that timeline that I think has been released to you um, that are what we consider to be nominal events. They're just, um, they're just good milestones to have on there to help you anchor other things. This is Seth Bornstein with Night Reader Newspapers again. And I, I apologize for, once again, the, the personal intrusions. But it, um, can you describe in the days since then sort of the, uh, not just the emotional, but the, the, the physical change that affects the last few weeks have had on you and your crew members? Your... Um, I don't, tired. Um, other than that, I, I don't know physically what, what affects uh, what effects that uh, we're having. Um, but for me personally, I'm, I'm a little bit more tired than I usually am. Okay, and I believe that's all the questions from Kennedy, so we'll come back here for a few follow-ups if we have them. Um, any over on this side? No. Go to Mark. Back there. Thanks, Mark Corot from the Houston Chronicle. Um, I think this is a question and a half. The, the more important is uh, if you could go back to what the mission management team representative told you, I guess this was Phil Engeloff, about the independent siding. Uh, was it Mr. Engeloff that talked to you? And can you recall or characterize what it was he, he told you at that point about the outside report and the source of it? I guess I wasn't clear 
whether it was the, the TV station tracking or someone who actually, you know, worked for you guys or with DOD or somebody. And after that question, could you tell us how many people were in the control room that you were supervising that day? The, um, with respect to the, uh, the discussion that Phil and I had, um, I, don't, I don't recall the specifics of the source. Um, you're right, that was a separate event from when we saw a video stream later, a few minutes later, um, is when we actually saw a video stream, um, the one that CNN had picked up. Um, I, don't, I don't know the details of, of uh, for example, was it, a na was it somebody seen with a naked eye or with binoculars? Or, um, we, we didn't talk about that. That wasn't part of our exchange. Um, and then you had a second question. Well, I wondered if you could sort of characterize what what he told you, and then I had the side question about how many people were working for you in the control room that day. Right. Okay. Um, what he told me basically was that th there was a the the sighting um, of multiple objects in the flyover that that was in the sp in the space and time that should have been the orbiter and one object. Um, and with respect to the number of people in the control center, um, of course, in, on the immediate team in what we call the front room or the, the, the front flight control room, there's around uh, 20 um, people. And then, of course, they each have smaller teams supporting them, in some cases um, on the order of uh, 10 or 15 or 20 in the case of the flight dynamics folks. So. I don't have an exact number for you, Mark. We can get that for you if you want an exact number. Further questions? Go ahead. Sir, uh, it, it sounds like each of the space shuttles seem to have their own personality for people who have worked on many missions. Can you talk a little bit about Columbia, what distinguished it from the other shuttles, and uh, whether it was seen as a, a workhorse sort of craft, whether it was seen as a... Uh, more modern. What what distinguished it, and what made it better, and uh, and potentially what made it uh, seen, what what made it problematic, perhaps for uh, people who worked on mission control. Well, the um, Columbia was was kind of a workhorse for us in a way. Um, Columbia, of course, was a little bit heavier than the other vehicles, and so we had uh, we always had. Uh, a little bit more of a performance challenge from from an ascent performance standpoint. Um, Columbia, of course, being the, f the the first vehicle that we flew and the first four flights um, was kind of our our uh, maiden vehicle, if you will. And I think there was kind of we had kind of a love affair with Columbia for that reason, if no other. Um, but uh, but definitely um, people had it something about Columbia that they could identify with, as you say, we do with the other vehicles as well. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, Juan Lozano with the AP. I just want to know on, on the shuttle uh, in general, are there sensors that specifically indicate if there is any kind of opening, maybe a premature opening in the wheel well, or if there's any kind of breach or anything like that, that would specifically tell you that. And if there are, did, that, did, did you all get any kind of indications like that? We don't have any sensors of that nature. Of course, we have multiple uh, temperature and pressure um, sensors and, and performance kind of sensors on, all, uh, on the equipment that we do have in the wing. Of course, the wing is not that highly instrumented in and of itself. The wheel well area is because of all the equipment in it. Um, and, uh, and, and then at the back of the wing where the elevons and the actuators are, there's, there's some instrumentation and, of course, um, some measurements. But, but it, is not, um, it is not, does not have the kind of sensors that would tell you if you had some kind of hole to vacuum. Um. Do we have a further question here? Okay, back here, Mark. Just a fact question. How many entries have you supervised and how many ascents? Well, you're going to make me count it, aren't you? Because I don't know off the top of my head. We'll, we'll get you that number. It's, it's around 10 or 12 total between entries and ascents. 
Okay, and uh, I'll try to make everybody happy, so let's go back to KSC. I think they have one follow-up there. We'll, we'll take that one now. Thanks. It's uh, Bill Harwood with CBS. Leroy, um, I had heard uh, that you guys did pull a little data out of the stuff that uh, came after the the unofficial loss of signal or whatever. I'd even heard that uh, you showed zero hydraulic pressure on the left side uh, and the APUs are running. I, I realize I'm not asking you to tell me anything you can't tell me, but have you ever seen any data that shows zero pressure on the left side? Um, I haven't seen it personally. Um, I do know that that we have had some success in the past two days specifically with being able to um, glean some new data from a, a few of those seconds at the end of that 32 seconds. Um, I don't know the details of which parameters. If I, if I try to tell you that, I'll probably remember it wrong, but we could certainly, you know, provide that information to you as we, as we uh, determine that it's good and valid data. One of the things that we're going to be very careful about um, with that data is to make sure that, that we understand in which subsystems we have good and valid data in that time frame and which ones we don't, and so that we can be very clear as we, as we begin to put the story together. Um, it's very possible that some of those frames will have good data for some of the subsystems and not the others, and it has to do with the way the data is packaged um, and the parent words and, and things of that nature. So we're going to be very careful with that. On the hydraulic pressure specifically, I, I have not seen that myself. And uh, any further at KSC? Yeah, one more from Chris Kreidler. I'm sorry my ignorance of the uh, entry flight director loops and so on. Is there just one loop? It seems we heard one loop, or are there, is there other chatter going on that maybe we haven't heard? Um, there are, there's only one flight director loop, and it is the, the decisional loop, if you, if you want to think of it that way. That is really where the, com the command and control takes place, and, of course, air-to-grounds is how we relay that to the crew. Um, there are many other voice loops that we use to talk to various other entities, both in and outside of the control center, that are part of the operation. And I think that's all the questions from KSC. No further questions here at JSC, so we'll conclude the briefing. Thank you very much, Leroy, and thank you all. Thank you.